it's still not to be done. Amen. Uh, first of all, for those of you who may know me or not, uh, there's one slide, I, uh, Elijah, not Isaiah, but Elijah. Elijah, there's one slide with my name and David's name, and then that second one has the link that we want to make sure people have access to. So I'm Joseph Pearson, and I've been doing my seminar and workshop entitled Christianity and Homosexuality for about 20 years. During that period of time, I was the senior pastor of Healing Waters Ministries in Tempe, Arizona. I'm now retired from, uh, from being senior pastor. No, I didn't get, that means uh, I'm a pastor emeritus. That means I didn't get kicked out. So, which is really good. It's very good. It's excellent that, that I wasn't kicked out. Uh, and then also during the, this time, I've been uh, the international president for Christ Evangelical Bible Institute. We have three thriving branch campuses, uh, one in the Philippines, one in India, and one in Tanzania. And I'm very fortunate this day to have with me the Associate Pastor of Faith Baptist Church in India, who's also the CB President of India. And so he is the top leader in the Christ Evangelical Bible Institute in India. God provided him the opportunity to be here. God provided us with the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the invitation that we had. We thank you that we can share a few things with you. That's really what we want to do, is share a few things with you. Um, what's the plan? You see, when you teach something, here's uh, instructional design in a nutshell. When you teach something, you tell them what you're going to teach. Then you teach it, and then you tell them what you thought. That's, that's instructional design. Uh, people can make it all sorts of different other ways. But that is what it is in a nutshell. Uh, it, when you preach, you just tell them. Uh, you don't have to tell them what you're going to tell them. And you don't have to tell them what you told them. But when you preach, you just tell them. But when you teach, you tell them what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> so that's, that's the difference between teaching and preaching. That's the only difference between teaching and preaching. And to this very day, people confuse it and don't know whether it's a five-fold ministry or a four-fold ministry. And they argue about that, but we're not going to split hairs. If you want to call it a five-fold ministry, so be it. If you want to call it a four-fold ministry, fine. That's just fine. Uh, Pastor Randy said, make sure you talk about politics. Right? No. no, he did not. <laughs> So fourfold versus fivefold. That's the only politics we're going to talk about. It's dividing the word of God about whether it's fourfold or fivefold. But the, uh, the Lord is gracious to us, and, and we do agonize. Even when we're called to speak, we, uh, we, I've been agonizing for about four, six weeks or so, uh, knowing that I was going to, I, I wasn't in agony. Right. I was agonizing. There's a real difference. It's as different as when you say, suffer the little children. It's very different from, let the children suffer. Right. You, know, you, you don't mean the same thing when right. you're saying, let the children suffer. Suffer the little children. So we agonize. We think carefully. We do want to be God-directed at all costs. We want Him to be the leader. Uh, we want Him to be the guide. We want the Holy Spirit to have total reign over what it is that we share, but we still go to different places in our minds and we say, Lord, is this what you want me to cover? Lord, is this what you want me to cover? Lord, what it is that what is it that you want me and us to cover? So in the time that we have with you this evening, I'm going to talk for a while. I'm going to talk, you're talking ahead for a while. And then, uh, then I'm going to interview uh, Pastor Davy. David, I call him Davy. Uh, but Pastor David from India, and then he's going to talk for a while, and then our time will be over for this evening. And we're going to talk, we're going to focus on missions, global missions. Sometimes people call them um, foreign missions. Now, if you took a, a language, a foreign language in high school, then the department would have been called at that time, because I don't see anybody 17. Um, maybe there's, is there somebody 17 or younger here? No, okay. So if you're not 17 or younger, then you probably took a foreign language in school. 
But the department names are different now. They call it world language. World language. To emphasize that what may be foreign to one person is not foreign to another person. So we kind of adopt that too in missions. So global missions, and then global missions includes home missions, as well as foreign missions, so international missions. Whatever it is you want to call it, it's just fine with me. I'm just introducing an idea about thinking globally, thinking internationally, and that we are part of the international circuit, so to speak. We're part, and everybody's part globally. Uh, and I asked the Lord, I said, what is the word, the primary word? Because that's what I do, is I look for a primary word that he has. And the primary word that the Lord has for you this evening is from John chapter 21, verse 6. John chapter 21, verse 6. I'll read a few verses before that, but I'll emphasize verse 6 when I get to it. Um, he says... He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? You know that Jesus likes fish, don't you? He, Jesus just likes fish. Give me some of that fish. That's what Jesus says. I don't know if you remember that commercial, but give me some fish. We are supposed to catch fish. Did you know that? You and I are supposed to catch fish. And, uh, and we got to hook them with the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit has to cement that hooking so that they are pulled in. But you, here's the word that God, the primary word that God has for me to share with you, is that we're only, going, we're only using a hook, line, and sinker. When Jesus is telling us something else, and you'll see it in just a minute. So we just go after a nibble here. Now, I'm not a fisher person. Maybe you're a fisher person. And I, don't, I mean that to go to the lake or to, to fish for this. There's, but it's, it's my understanding that if you go fishing, sometimes people like to catch specific fish. Yes, sir. And so uh, then they need the right uh, uh, bob or, or whatever it's called. What is that? Lure. lure. Yeah, lure. Thank you. So the bob. Anyway, uh, <laughs> they need the right lure. Yeah, because certain fish are attracted to certain lures. That's right. And thank you, praise God, amen. amen. So, so uh, and then so specific, so as we minister to people in the GLBT community, we use specific lures because we know the people and we know what might attract them and then we pull them in, we reel them in. So Jesus says reel those fish in, but you see, we don't do the scaling. That's a big problem with Christians. Sometimes we think because we reel them in, that we should scale them too. But the Holy Spirit does the scaling. Right. He removes the scales. We just help catch the fish. And the truth be told, the, the Word of God is the worm, is the lure. And the Holy Spirit is the one that unites the person, the, the fish that's caught. But God is, is saying, Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying to us today, this day, He's saying, you've set your sights too low. And just just doing using one hook line and sinker. He said, I understand why you want to use one hook line and sinker, and you are effective in using one hook, hook line and sinker. But here's what the Lord Jesus is saying. And so in verse 5 he says, Call them, he called out to the friends, Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Jesus said, and this is what is the primary message for you today. He said, and I'm, I'm reading from the New International Version, but I'm, the first word that I'm going to use is from the King James Version because I like the word cast better. So he says, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Amen. There's a companion verse so there's a secondary verse. I told you I was looking for the primary message that, that God has for you. I just read the primary message. The primary message is that you should stop using a hook, line, and sinker and waiting for nibbles. That you should throw, you should cast the net in. And then by casting the net, you're going to have an abundance of fish. And, and 
when you're looking for the nibbles, you're only aiming toward a specific person that meets your criteria. But God wants you to go beyond the specific person that meets your criterion, and that He wants to use to be more in inclusive. Oh, that's that word. Inclusive. He wants you to be more inclusive. The companion verse to that is in uh, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. He says in verse 49, 47, excuse me. This is Jesus speaking again. So, Matthew 13, verse 47, if you're looking at that. Once again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Once again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught one kind of fish. No. Caught only one kind of fish. No. no, what kind of fish? All, all kinds of fish. All kinds of fish. All kinds of fish. I know, I know, I know. I've been there. I've done that. I've experienced it. I understand what it means to be rejected and oppressed and victimized. I understand. I've experienced it. But Jesus says, good, good. Good, good. Because he's taught us a lesson. Because you see, we can't minister to the brokenhearted unless we ourselves are broken. Right. How can you minister to some if you've never known brokenheartedness? Then how can you minister to somebody that is brokenhearted? It'll go above you, beyond you. You won't grasp it. You won't understand. You just won't understand anything about it. You can say, uh, oh, "Too bad." You know, oh well, I hope you do better. <laughs> Get yourself some food. <laughs> Help yourself to the buffet table, and and you'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a, another message too. The Lord has for you mm -hmm. is that you've been rejected, uh, and victimized, and oppressed, and now Jesus says, "Okay, we don't want to be dysfunctional. We don't want to pretend." That didn't happen. Because that's what dysfunctionality is. Mm -hmm. Pretending, oh, I was never victimized. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was never oppressed. Oh, I was never abused. No, that's being dysfunctional and lying to yourself. Right. No, what you say is, this has happened to me. And Jesus says, acknowledge it and move on. Amen. Acknowledge it and move on because otherwise you're going to get caught in that party known as a pity party. Right. And it may be your party... And you'll cry if you want to. But nobody else wants to cry with you, if you understand. <laughs> nobody else wants to cry with you. And so Jesus said, Jesus, the Lord is speaking to you right now. And uh, one of the things that we've been praying is that we've been praying that, that your hearts become arrested. That God arrests your heart. See, you love the Lord. But that God already, and, and what we're trying to do is engage you in what it is that we're trying to share with you today. But we want the Lord to arrest your hearts with regard to ministering to other people. Yes. But, but not just with hook, line, and sinker, right. but with a net. Yes. Because you cast the net in, and then you're going to get a whole group of fish and some of the people that you had originally wanted to uh, attend to and minister to, they'll be part of that net. Sure. They'll just naturally, because it says in the companion verse that I just read, in uh, Matthew 13, 47, is once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. So praise God. So God is saying you're limited because you're limiting yourself. That's why you're limited. So what you need to do is you need to minister to more people. And it's understandable why you might want to minister to just one group of people. Because you have some camaraderie with them. You have some shared experiences with them. You have shared culture with them. Uh, Pastor Davey from India, I said to him, the gay and lesbian community, the GLBT community, is a little bit like the deaf community, the hearing impaired community. 
I said a hundred years ago, um, the, the, when you were born hearing impaired or deaf, you were at home and you were isolated. Later on, decades later, then some states developed some uh, schools for the deaf or the hearing impaired. And uh, then the hearing impaired got together and they stopped being isolated. And then once they stopped being isolated, they developed a culture between and amongst themselves. That's how you and I are like the hearing impaired or the deaf. Because once, and maybe some of you from the time that you live, when you grew up, you were isolated. You were isolated. And you, and you know, you really can't have a culture when you're just all alone. <laughs> you can't really have a culture. You could have something called a, a familial culture, the family culture. Uh, but if the family is not accepting of you as a, and many deaf or hearing impaired people were not accepted, they were tried, they tried to teach them how to talk and to not use sign. So don't use sign, be other than who you are, fit in. And fit in by speaking so, because it's, it's comfortable to us. If you speak, we don't, want to, we don't want to learn sign language. We're your parents, but we don't want to learn sign language. So we're like that. We have a culture now. We have a culture. We have uh, relationships with each other. But that culture developed and, and is still developing. It's still developing. But what happens is that you and I get into a cultural understanding and experience, and then we get to feel so comfortable. Oh, this is good. This is good. I'm a with, I'm a with the other people that feel the same way that I do. That, oh, I don't have to worry anymore. I don't have to, to break, I'm using uh, from a program, I don't have to break heterosexuality, breaking heterosexuality. There's a program called Breaking Amish. If you, if you break Amish, you leave the Amish people and you're shunned. So in a way, we broke heterosexuality. Does that make sense okay, to you? Yeah. We weren't heterosexual, but we broke from the heterosexual society and then once for many of us, not for every single one of us, but then we were shunned, you know. So we, we were shunned. We're, uh, we're just thought of, well, you, uh, you chose to be this way or that. You know the whole stuff. I don't have to tell you that shtick, shtick. That's what it's called. I don't have to tell you that. So uh, the, the Lord's saying, okay, so I understand what, you see, that the Lord, when he was here, he didn't go in to change politics. He didn't go in to, to set everything aright from a political standpoint. And when the Apostle Paul was out there, he didn't try to change everybody. No, he, he, under, he acknowledged that there's certain things that occur in society. And uh, he didn't go around and try to change things. Uh, because what they were trying to do is change hearts and trying to change people and let the Lord do the work, let the Lord do the scaling, let the Lord teach this society how to be more mature and how to, be, how to embrace their fellow people, male and female, and to create a much better place. That's what the Lord... So the Lord, when the Lord returns, He will set everything aright right. in that area. Yeah. So the Lord, all power has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, all power in heaven and on earth. Scripture says that. But not everything has been put under his feet yet. Death hasn't been put under his feet. Death hasn't been put under his feet. The Antichrist hasn't been put under his feet yet. My point is, is that he has all power, but not everything has been put under his feet. Amen. So there's a, there's a right time. The Lord God Almighty has a pure will and perfect timing. So we've got to trust the Lord with regard to His timing and His appointed time. So the Lord appoints times for us and creates opportunities. The Lord is still the Creator, and as the Creator, He creates opportunities. I'm going to tell you one of the saddest stories that I know personally. One of the most grievous stories that I know personally. You know, I'm going around the country... For about 20 years, I've gotten to know and become fond of certain churches and certain pastors. And I've told Pastor Randy, this is, this is uh, 
but not because I'm here. <laughs> but this is top in my book. This is the top place. This is where I say, oh, if you're in Georgia, make sure you go there. Make sure you go there. And um, but there's another place like that. Uh, there's a few others. There may be five or six churches. If I can't recommend them, I just smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, let me know how it is. Um, <laughs> so I don't say anything negative, I just simply don't say. So for me, I always tell people, watch what I don't say, yeah. rather than watch what I say. But this church is a special church in my mind, top notch, top, um, and, and for a number of reasons, and, and first and foremost, the the leadership and the type of people that it attracts. So, I, I have a friend's church that has sponsored me many times, that I've been to many times. I have a good relationship with the pastor, good relationship with the, the congregation. I have done things for them, I willingly and gladly, and they have done things for me, willingly and gladly. But I called up the pastor, this is about seven years ago, eight years ago, and I said, a friend of mine, well-known pastor from another country, I'm going to tell you the name of the country in just a little bit, but I said, I've got a, a straight pastor friend of mine from another country, I told him the name of the country, and I said, would you be, he's going to be in your state, did I say the state already? Good. I don't want to say the state, so, um, but sometimes my brain slips, and it's like the gears in your car. I've said it. Uh -oh. There I've said it. So I called him and I said I said to to him, I will say him, so you identify what I'm talking about. I said to him, I said, I've got a straight pastor friend, well known pastor from this country, and I said, Please uh, can you host him? He's gonna be in your state. Could you host him for maybe three, four, five days? I want him to see uh, an affirming church in action. He's planning to be in your state anyway. He wasn't planning to be in this state, otherwise I would have told him to come here. But he was going to be in that state. And the pastor said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let me." He said, in a, a day or two, I'm going to have a board meeting and I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. You know, because there are different churches are driven different. You know that. You just respect it. So I said, great. And so he called back like three or four days later, and he said, I met with the, uh, the board, and the board said, it's not within our mission. It's not within our mission to the GLBT community to host this particular pastor. Now, I have to tell you that I was personally wounded, but I, I'm an old dog. I come back even with a kick. So I, I, I was personally wounded. I thought, well, you know. It's not often that I call you up and ask you this. Would you please just consider it? You know? So, but I, I pushed that aside. But you see, and I understand where they were coming from, and I still have a good relationship with them, and I still have been there uh, not too long ago. But the, uh, the pastor said, the board said it's not within our mission uh, to host this particular pastor. And the reason, the reason, sisters and brothers, that it grieves me to this very day is that well-known straight pastor was from Uganda. Oh. And if anybody needed to be amongst GLBT people, yeah. and if anybody needed to, to have a sense of what GLBT people, uh, Christian people are about, it was this pastor who could have been said, no, 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 I've seen them in action. I've seen how they, how the spirit moves uh, amongst them. And within a few years uh, after that, it was when they started to try to enact the law to, uh, to not only, you see, when I was in Uganda, and I was in Uganda, the, past, the uh, president had a very soft tone. He, his soft tone was just that all homosexuals should be in prison. But then his tone changed, and he said, "All homosexuals should be killed." And that was his that was his change. But you see, you never know what God is going to do and how God is going to use people, and you never know. I I I'm just I always think God gave this imagination. 
we should use our imagination. How can how God could have used that? I tell you, he was a well-known pastor for you. He wasn't just from a little tiny village somewhere. He was a well-known a, a bishop, really. You know, had a number of churches under him, respected, and and uh, had no problem personally. But he needed to see us in action. And they, they said, it's not part of our mission. Oh my gosh. That grieves me to this very day. Because I wonder who was killed because he wasn't a voice to say, stop. Don't do that. But praise God. Now I called, I called Pastor Randy. And I said, to, I said to Pastor, actually, Pastor Jonathan from Tanzania, who I work with, I said, he's coming in. And uh, he's asked me, see, I do a lot with timing. I do a lot with time. Um, and I, if I do a lot with time, I should check. <laughs> I'm, I'm boasting that I oh, do so much with timing. I can't even check my own one. So, so just a few moments. Um, so I do a lot with time. You know, I, I was in 2004. I was invited to Tanzania by two pastors, and they said, they said to me, "We we want you to do the seminar uh, Christianity and Homosexuality Reconciled." And so I, I I was happy to do that. And I got there, and then I said, well, "The people they've invited, they're, they're, none of them are GLBT people." It's like if you invited me here and I wanted, my, my theme was to talk to you about the Thornians. Are you catching me? Yeah. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. So if I, if I said, well, I'm going to talk to you today. Oh, Pastor Randy, I'm going to talk to them about Lithuanians today. And maybe by chance one of you is a Lithuanian, but, uh, but probably the majority of you are Lithuanians. And you would be clueless about what it was that I was going to say. So what I so I got there. I was all prepared, handouts and everything, and I said, you know what? I'm just going to flip this. I said to myself, I'm just going to flip this baby. And what I did is I flipped it uh, so that I talked about solely rejected people, uh, and oppressed people, and victimized people, and uh, that worked out perfectly. Now the, the the people that I work with, their theme and their mission is uh, ministering to rejected people. But anyway, Pastor Jonathan from Tanzania, who was the original one of the original pastors that invited me in 2004, uh, recently contacted me and he said we we're just starting to see GLBT people uh, come. He didn't use that terminology, but you understand. So we're just starting to see GL. We need to know now. We need to know. We know we're aware of you. We know what you do. Now we need to you for uh, uh, you to teach us. So that we'll know how to treat them and this and that. And so I said, great. And so he was going to come the first week in October. And uh, I talked to Pastor Randy and shared with him that what I was going to do is I was going to spend a week with him going over the workshop, you know, a, day, a few hours a day, and to minister to him so that it was solidly planted, just like I'm doing with David right now, so that it's solidly planted, you know, using scripture. Uh, we don't have to lay claim to a uh, suspicious scripture in order. I'm just going to put it that way because I, I'm not supposed to talk about politics. So, so I'm, I'm not going to lay claim to suspicious scripture when there's enough clear scripture that, that you can use to show the reconcilability of Christianity. Why should I use a suspicious scripture? <laughs> Uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, then I'll tell you what suspicious scriptures are in the alley, all right? <laughs> How it's used suspiciously. And some of you have been not only around the block, but down the alley if you touched it. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying when I say that we have to be aware of, of who it is that's in need when they're in need. Yeah. So I said, great, you come. And then he called. And then, so everything that was arranged with Pastor Randy was on the basis of Pastor Jonathan from Tanzania coming. And then I, I then Pastor Jonathan called me and he said, my funding has not come through. So I won't be able to come now. I'll, I'll maybe be able to come in another time. 
And so that was a Monday when I found out. No, it was a Friday when I found out. And I agonized. I agonized because this was an opportunity that I knew that God had created. And then, and then Pastor Davey called me. And, or not called me, but texted me and said, I'm coming to the United States. Uh, I want to stay with you. And then uh, he said he was, he, without me talking to him, he, he was coming in on October 2nd. And, uh, and then there was the answer to my prayer after the agony. Then I was able to call Pastor Randy and say, I won't be bringing the, the guy from, from Tanzania. I'll be bringing the guy from India. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's, that's how, and a guy is a good word. Yeah, a guy is a good, good word. So, so the Lord creates opportunities. Yeah. He still creates opportunities. Yeah. And, uh, and then he, he, uh, he creates opportunities to meet and minister to people. And to, brother, you know, we've talked about, on the journey here, we drove from my home in Michigan City, Indiana, which is about an hour and a half, 15 minutes if you go really fast. <laughs> and so we talked about what we were going to talk about. And so um, I was going to say, I'm going to share a few things with him, and then I'm going to do an interview with you. I'm going to interview you. And then, uh, because this is a good new experience for him, too. You haven't seen so many GLBT people in the whole, in the whole room together like this, praise God. And to know we're going to be Yeah, we're just going to share this. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we're going to interview him, and then, then he's going to take some last minutes to present a few things to you that we've talked about. And this continues to tomorrow at 12 noon until 2 o'clock, and then uh, we're going to do a tag sermon on Sunday. Uh, so I'm going to preach a little bit, and then I'll chat to him, and he'll preach a little bit, and then he'll tag me in. And we will we'll do that within the time. allotted time given. I promise. <laughs> we are here to serve you and not for you to serve us. Um, brother, and uh, first of all, they don't know you. I, I, I don't know you. Uh, who are you? I'm Pastor David Livingston from India. And I'm the president of Asiya India. And why are why are you in the United States now? Um, actually, I got uh, an opportunity to be here. Uh, I want, actually I want to. Uh, I came here to talk to some churches, but after I came here to Atlanta, I'm sure God brought me here to teach me a few more things for my future ministry. Amen. Praise God. And so, um, specifically, why are you here at this church? Well, I want to prepare myself. Uh, maybe in future, um, it will help me to minister to the gay people in India. I don't want to. I want to. I want to share the gospel with them. I want to share the love. I'm sharing with the straight people. I want to bring them to Jesus. That's my intention. Praise God. Are you here in the heart? Are you here in the heart? See. Without, uh, without uh, putting a due burden on him, uh, this, he, how old are you, brother? I'm 27 years. Yeah, so this is the future of him. This is the future of him. And uh, I told him, and I've told him a few times that I'm not going to speak for him, but I will repeat things he has said to me. You know? And so when, I, when we talked and he said, he said out of his own mouth, um, um, you know, on, uh, for, not forced or anything. He said, I don't want to be narrow. I don't want to be narrow, and I want to learn as much as I can. And then you also talked, uh, now, in, in India, is there a group of people that you primarily minister to? Yeah, uh, there are, mostly we are ministering to, to Hindus, and uh, uh, there are actually Christians are rejected in India uh, because of the beliefs in Jesus. We are actually we are rejected in India, uh, but we are even we are rejected. We are ministering. We are we are sharing. We are introducing Jesus to the to those Hindu Hindus in our India. And uh, a brother said to me, he said, if there are Hindus at one of my crusades, I want to make sure that if they're gay, they understand that their invitation is to them too yes. to accept Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Right. So. 
One of the things that I personally would ask of you is to pray, pray to the Lord to give him strength. Amen. Because, for example, he's going to hear the same things you and I have heard all of our lives. Once you start taking up for us, then you'll get the same kind of treatment that we get all the time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, and so when you talked with the pastor recently or chatted with them and told them um, uh, things, what, what happened? Actually, uh, uh, some other pastor uh, on Facebook, he messaged me on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, he wants to work with my ministry. And he said, he asked me a few questions about my ministry. And he said, I'm a gay. And I'm not about gay or lesbian, whoever they are. And uh, I asked one of uh, other my uh, Facebook friend, uh, who is gay? I mean, what is gay? What is that okay to work with them? Is that okay to minister with them? Uh, he said, no, I do not work with them because gays are not allowed into heaven. Uh, that that makes me hurt because uh, that I, I know that is true. I know he's uh, he's saying false. I mean, uh, he's narrow minded. I think uh, I'm not sure about. It. I think he's narrow minded. Uh, because of that, he says that. The Lord, and then this is a, a message to all of us as well as to David, is that the Lord says, be wise as a serpent. Right. He says, I'm sending you out amongst wolves. Yes. And some of you don't like to hear that because you've already adopted a position in life where you say, I only, only want to see the good in I only want to see the good in people. I'm not going to look for the bad. We're not asking you to look for the bad. We're asking you to recognize. <laughs> not, there's a difference between looking for the bad and for recognizing it. So uh, the idea, and that's part of discernment as well. And so the Lord Jesus says, I'm sending you out amongst wolves. Be wise as a serpent, but harmless as dove. So praise God. So if you say to yourself, oh, I don't see anybody trying to con me, then you're going to be con. You know? Are you understanding? Are you tracking with me? You're going to be con. Uh, some of you have had to be been conned a few times in order to learn your lesson. But probably you'll learn your lesson by now. So, uh, brother, what, what, uh, what do you think about, about this in, in terms of your future? Uh, about... G, uh, about gay and lesbian people and, and crusades and ministry to other people? Um, well, uh, man, I'm sure about it. I mean, in future, in the near future, I will surely get, meet up some gay, gays in India. Yeah. I, I do not know they're gays. Um, while I'm preaching, we, we used to go to uh, Hindu villages, so we used to preach the gospel on streets. While we are preaching and while we are singing, while praying for the people, there might be a gay. Yeah. He may come to me and I want to accept, I want to be a part, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to know more about Jesus. What should I say? I should not say, Jesus is not your God. You should not follow Him. You should not accept Him. Jesus is Jesus. Salvation is salvation to everyone. And so, uh, the time that, the, that Brother Davey wrote to me, and he said, uh, can I work with a gay? And, uh, and, I, and I said, oh, gee, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I, I said, uh, this is the way I put it. I said, homosexual Christians are the same as, do you remember me answering that? I said, homosexual Christians are the same as heterosexual Christians. And then he wrote back and he said, what is heterosexual? And I said, you're heterosexual. You're married to a woman. And homosexual Christians are married to people of the same sex. Uh, and so there you go. And, 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 then, and then he said again, he said, well, can I work with them? I said, I've already given you the answer. So they're the same. And, uh, and he understood. He, he got the, the drink. Amen. So praise God. And so God has him here for a reason. Because as he, uh, as he has said to me, he said that probably India is a, a few decades behind the United States. So just as gay people emerged in my life, I'm 65 this year, so gay people emerged uh, for me 50 years ago. You know, I, there, you know, I grew up in Chicago, and there was one gay restaurant as a senior in high school that I went to where the gay kids hung out, which, uh, uh, lesbians and gay males hung out. And so we would, we would party 
into partying in the old sense of the word. <laughs> if you understand <laughs> <laughs> Where you had streamers of music, things like that. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we would party and we would have all, all sorts of a, a good time. And I remember as a senior in high school, slow dancing yeah, in Eddie Guggen's basement uh, with my boyfriend. Uh, and then in, in high school, you know, the only, only gay people in, when I was in high school, the only gay people were out were the ones who were the future hairdressers of the United States. They were out because they couldn't help but be out. <laughs> but they would wait for me after school and because they knew that I, I would put up a fight. And uh, they would walk home with me because I, I, would, I would get into a fight if anybody bothered. And so uh, that's what they would do. Is they, what, what, they would say to me, Psst, well, what's your last class? Where are you going to be? Where are you going to be exiting the building? Because that's what I was. I was a fighter. And uh, still I'm a fighter. But I, I tame, I'm a little bit tamer. So, brother, I've asked brother to, to share what's on his heart. I've asked him specifically uh, to talk about ten reasons why India is fertile ground for a uh, harvest. And, but, but you see, because of flexibility, I said, I said, here's your assignment, and then just get up and talk. You know, just talk, do whatever God wants you to do. And so if you want to go through those, whatever is on your heart, that's what I want you to do. All right? That's what the Lord wants you to do. Praise God. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so thankful to my spiritual father, Dr. Joe, and I'm so thankful to Pastor Randy for uh, having me here, and all the church, all the other members. I'm so thankful to you guys. Today, I'm, I'm so glad. Uh, I want to tell you one thing before I share 10 important, I mean, uh, reasons why India is a good country for global missions. Actually, before I... Uh, Fly from uh, before I start from India, I thought God is, I mean, uh, leading me to the United States to speak about or to preach or to share some something, uh, or to, sh sh to share a few things from Bible. But after I, I came here, I met Dr. Joe and he started talking about the conference or the event of, the event of uh, uh, Atlanta, I mean, uh, New Covenant Church in Atlanta. And I was thinking about about it. I, do, I ever, I never ever meet a gay person in India. Then God opened my heart and mind. I thought about it. How can I share to them? How can I talk to them? I do not know them. I, I, I do not know how they think. I do not know how they are. I do not know where they are. It, it, those, all these questions started. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, disturbs my mind a lot. And I was praying a lot, and I realized God's plan. God even brought me to the United States to share the gospel. God even brought me here to Atlanta to share something what I know. But God brought me here to more about you guys. Because God is preparing me. God is training me up today to know more, know, to know more about you. He's training me to reach many, many more guests in India and coming guests. And you are, I, I see the God's presence here, you are dedicated, I, I can understand, you have, you guys have great heart, like strike, strike pastors or strike people have for Jesus, I can understand that, I told you, I told you, I told you, Joe, I understand Everything is same, except the feelings. I do not know. I may, I may tell it or not. I'm so I'm, excuse me if I, if I did, if I do, if I'm saying anything wrong. I'm so glad, my brothers and sisters. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to know more about you guys. It will surely help me in my in my future ministry. Well, I want to let you know a few things about India. I think a few of you guys know about India. It's a huge country. 
it's a Hindu country. People used to say about India very proudly, India is a model, it's a, India is a role model for unity in diversity. There are many more religious in India. They are saying the government, Indian government or Indian politicians or whoever, they used to say we, have to, we are united we even we are worshipping different gods and goddesses. That is, that is false. We are rejected in India. I mean Christians are rejected in India. People, Hindus are killing Christians. Hindus are killing their neighbors because they believe in Jesus. Hindus are killing people, I mean Christians who are worshipping <coughs> in a church. They are breaking that church building down while they are worshipping or worshipping Jesus. A lot of terrible things is going on. I want to I want to let you know, I want to introduce India. I want to know, I want to tell you guys where India is. What India is. I want to describe India. India is a dark nation. You may ask me, how you say how can you say that? India has you believe it or not, India has more than 300 billion God, 300 million gods and goddesses. Indian people are every day. The Indian the Hindus are used. They used to worship each day each god. There are more than 300 million gods and goddesses only in India. Those false gods, those false goddesses, they cover the eyes of the people in India. So that whole country, that India, became dark. How can we bring them to light? India is in darkness. They can't see anymore. They can't see. They can't see things like they can see their neighbors. They can see homes, but they can't see the spiritual things. They can't. They can't save the Holy Spirit. They can't see the blessings. They can't. They they, they cannot do that because their spiritual eyes were covered by the gods. And God is false gods and goddess. That is why India still in darkness. How can we bring how can we bring India to light? Jesus is light. Amen. We want you. We're working hard to introduce them Jesus. That means we are introducing them the light. Brothers, we are sure we used to tell them, brothers, you are in darkness. Here is the light. If you want to walk through the light, if you want to. If you want to know where you are going, what is your destination, what's your aim, what's your, I mean, what's your, I mean, what's your aim? You can't see your aim, you can't reach your destination. If you, if you do not have light, light in your life, Amen. That's right. have Jesus in your life, Amen. you can see everything. I'm not speaking about physical things, mm -hmm. I'm speaking about spiritual things. So India is a dark nation. So there are 300 million gods and goddesses in India. They have many gods. Everyone are false. They do not know one true God, Jesus. We have been working. It's very hard to share the gospel. It's very hard to introduce Jesus to them. They used to ask very bad, very many more questions to prove Christianity is false. Christ is false. But we never lose our faith. We are fighting the good fight to bring them to the light. So that is why India is a good country for the global missions. You know why? India is a dark nation. It needs, India needs light. India needs Jesus. Amen. Amen. And the second one, and the second important, second and the important reason there are second and a third important reason. There are, there are two reasons or tie up with each other. The second one is few evangelists. And the third reason is poverty. India is a poor country. Hindus are pushing Christians back. Christians do not have good education. Christians cannot get a good job because all these Hindu organizations, Hindu people, still have caste feeling in their hearts. Christians, as I told you, Christians are untouchables. 
They cannot sit behind a, behind a Hindu person. Christians are untouchables, so they cannot come closer to a Hindu person. Christians are untouchables, so that, that's why they cannot do the same job that a Hindu person is doing. So, the poverty makes very few evangelists. There are many, I met many young guys who had a great dedication, who had a great heart for ministry. I want to let you, I want to uh, tell you an example. See, through CBI India, we have been training many people every year. From 2004 and 2012, we have been, we ordained our, and uh, we trained almost 200 people to serve the Lord, to ministers, to, to start their ministry. I want to tell you about a guy who uh, joined the CBA for the academic year of uh, 2012 and 2013. He has, uh, he joined the CBI India in uh, 2012, I mean, uh, uh, in June. <coughs> And uh, after he joined CBA India, unfortunately, his father was dying. And he has one ma he has a mother and uh, one sister. So the family, uh, his mother and uh, sister, they are depending <coughs> on this guy who was joined in CBA. But the person, the, that end guy, has great heart. He, he used to share his testimony, he used to share his deficiency, and he used to share his, about his future plans about his about future plans of his ministry and he is all the time he used to talk to he he wants to talk to me he wants to share things to with me about his future ministry brother i want to go to this place i want to go to that place i want to preach to these people i want to bring these people to christ so he has a great burden on his heart you know what that person should take care of his family that person should take care of his mother and sister what should he do? He left Syria, India, and he went to Hyderabad, and he got a job there, and he got a job to feed his mother, to feed his sister. It's very hard. He has great heart to serve Jesus. He has great heart to reach people for Jesus. But the poverty drags him back. Might be evil doing things to pull him back or drag him back to this world. I'm sure, I'm praying for him. I'm agonized for that person. And for that, my brother, my dear brother, I'm sure I will see him in ministry. I will see he will fish. I will see he will turn, uh, turn souls. I will, I will, I'm sure he will reach villages. I will, I'm sure he will reach people for Jesus. He will lead souls Amen. to Jesus. And the, and the next uh, four, and the next and fourth important reason why India is a good country for global missions that is less evangelism. Less evangelism. You know what? In second century, Saint Thomas came to India. He started preaching, or, or he started sharing the gospel to India in second century. I think you know, guys know about the population in India. It's 1 billion, 1.4 billion, right there? I do, I, I, I do not know the billions are more billion. Okay, 1.4 billion. St. Thomas came to India in second century. Please listen carefully, brothers. St. Thomas came to India in second century, and now we are in 21st century, right? You know the percentage of the Christianity in India? It's just 4 percentage. That means 40 million people are Christians in India. That seems a lot. 40, oh, 40 million people are Christians in India. But if you compare it with the population of India, there are 1 billion 200 and 600 people still to be reached. Wow. 1 billion 200, 206, 2, 260 million billion people still to be reached. Many people. Yes. Less evangelism. Less evangelists. The poverty makes less evangelists. 
the poverty makes less evangelism. In the span of 19 centuries, we just, the pastors, the evangelists, the preachers, the teachers, I mean Christian teachers, they just reach, they just lead 40 million people in India in 19 centuries, in the span of 19 centuries. How many more years we should need to reach 1 billion 260 million people? If you have few evangelists, we need more. The harvest is plenty Amen. in India. We need, there are many people, many, many villages. They, they never ever hear about Jesus. Sometimes I, along with my team and few of, few students of my few students from CBI, we used to go to other villages where there is no church. We used to walk on the streets. We used to sing songs and we used to pray for the people, sharing the gospel. I'm true. A few people came out of their house and they used to ask us, what, what you guys are doing? We used to say, we are, we are telling you about true God, Jesus. They used to ask us, who is this guy? Is he a new God? New God? Because every day you can see in TV Indian channels, there are many Swamis, many Swamijis. There became people are mad, they are crazy. They are believing the Swamis are gods. Every day, a God is born in. A God starts, a person starts a life as a God in India. So that people, they are thinking, Jesus is a new God. They are asking who, they used to ask, who is this new guy? Who is this Jesus? Who is Jesus? And if, if we said, if we, so if we told them, Jesus died on the cross a few years ago, 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross for you and for me. They said, we didn't, we didn't know Jesus, then how can he die for us? Like this question. They at least did not know Jesus. There are, there are such villages, there are such people it's still in India. They ever, they never, ever hear about Jesus. So still, there are many people. We are, we, we are, we, as a team, as a church, as a, many, many pastors, many ministries, many churches in India, working hard. They are agonized. They are praying a lot. They are, they are moving forward to win, to reach souls to Jesus, to the kingdom of, to the kingdom. And the, and the next, uh, next important reason is. Fear or afraid. Many people, they believe in Jesus. Many Hindus, many Muslims, many Sikhs, they are believing in Jesus. You know, they believe if we pray to Jesus, Jesus is able to do anything. They believe that. They have, they, their heart believes that. But, they are afraid of the people. They are afraid of the community. If, if a, for example, if a Hindu person, if a Hindu family believes, started believing in Jesus, if they started going to church, then the community will cast that family out of their...